Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome. Exciting news coming out of the UN Climate Conference in Egypt. Israel and Jordan are working to expedite a water for electricity accord. The deal, which was agreed upon over a year ago, involves the construction of a huge solar power farm in Jordan and a water desalination plant in northern Israel. The United Arab Emirates, Jordan and Israel signed a Memorandum of Understanding in Sharm el-Sheikh to accelerate the project and agreed to report on its progress at a conference in the UAE within the year. Israel has announced the discovery of several enormous natural gas reservoirs in the Mediterranean Sea. Energy and PLC, the hydrocarbon exploration and production company that has been excavating in the waters off Israel's coast, discovered a new reserve which it believes holds 13 billion cubic meters of natural gas. This is in addition to 3.75 BCMs found at another site nearby. The company has been doing exploratory drilling to confirm its belief that the Olympus area, located between Israel's Karish and Tanin gas fields, is rich with commercially viable gas. Energian began production at the Karish field last week after Israel signed the maritime border deal with Lebanon. That agreement was brokered by the United States. The Vatican has announced that Pope Francis will knight Rabbi A. James Rudin for his work in developing Judeo-Catholic relations. The Papal Order of St. Gregory has honored only nine Jews in its 200-year history, and this recognition is a sign of the increasing ties between the Jewish people and the Catholic Church. Cardinal Sean O'Malley, the Archbishop of Boston, said, For more than 50 years, Rabbi Rudin has worked to advance Catholic-Jewish relations and interfaith relations on a wider scale with extraordinary skill, dedication, and success. The United States reportedly scrambled fighter jets to thwart an imminent Iranian attack against American allies in the Middle East. According to a report in the Washington Post, U.S. warplanes took to the skies in response to a credible threat of Iranian ballistic missile and suicide drone attacks against Saudi Arabia and Iraq. The White House confirmed the report and issued a statement saying that CENTCOM is committed to its long-standing strategic military partnership with Saudi Arabia. In related news, Iran claims to have successfully tested a new satellite-carrying missile. The rocket is reportedly capable of carrying a payload of up to 80 kilograms and can launch a satellite 500 kilometers into space. The U.S. State Department called the rogue Islamic Republic's latest escalation unhelpful and destabilizing and added that Iran's continued development of space launch vehicles poses significant proliferation concerns. The United Nations Third Committee held a debate recently to discuss bringing Israel before the International Criminal Court at The Hague. The premise of the vote was to accuse Jews of illegally occupying their historic and biblical homeland. It falsely claims that the existence of Jews in Judea and Samaria is de facto annexation. The Palestinians who hold observer status in the UN have made several calculated moves to delegitimize Israel in the international arena. Morocco has made history by becoming the first Arab country to allow a Jewish synagogue on a university campus. Jerusalem and Marrakesh established formal diplomatic relations in 2020, just two months after former U.S. President Donald Trump signed the Abraham Accords. Since then, Morocco has been making strides in cooperation with the Jewish state, as well as repairing relations with its local Jewish population. King Mohammed VI has worked to restore 167 Jewish cemeteries and 20 synagogues throughout the North African nation. The new synagogue is located next to a mosque and is a sign of increasing tolerance and coexistence in the Muslim country. The Jewish House of Worship, which is open to all students, uses touch screens to teach about Jewish culture and its 2,000-year-old history in Morocco. The British Broadcasting Corporation has been accused of operating an anti-Israel bias and spreading hatred of Jews and Israel. The BBC is being threatened with a parliamentary inquiry over its anti-Israel coverage on its Arabic network, which is viewed by 36 million people around the world. Allegations of ignoring reporting errors, negative coverage of Jews in Israel, and disregarding demands for corrections have been registered against the network for years. 
These issues became more egregious during the 2021 conflict with Gaza when false reports aired without being retracted or corrected. The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan has issued a grave warning to Israel not to change what it calls the status quo on the Temple Mount. Despite regaining control of the old city of Jerusalem in 1967, Israel chose to allow the Muslim Wafq to maintain authority of Mount Moriah. This extremist Islamic body restricts non-Muslim visitation to the site and strictly forbids Jews and Christians from praying there. Israel has faced enormous pressure to open the site and to make it accessible to all faiths. Several members of the newly elected Israeli Knesset have vowed to amend the status quo on the Temple Mount, prompting Jordan to warn that any change which results in greater Jewish and Christian freedom of religion at the site will harm Israeli-Jordanian ties. Jewish organizations are warning that hateful messages about Jews is encouraging the spread of anti-Semitism throughout the United States. Kanye West and Kyrie Irving have made headlines for promoting a viciously anti-Semitic ideology. Their statements have been followed by a wave of hate-filled acts against the Jewish people, and watchdog organizations fear that the star's comments have sparked a rise in Jew hatred and the spread of hateful rhetoric throughout America. More than 30,000 Israelis are expected to travel to Qatar for the upcoming World Cup soccer games. This past June, the Gulf state announced that it would permit entry visas to Israelis traveling to Qatar for the tournament. Cypriot Airways, TUS, will operate flights from Israel to Qatar with a diplomatic stopover in Larnaca for the FIFA World Cup. Jerusalem and Doha still do not have diplomatic relations, but the move to allow Israelis into the country for the games is seen as a step forward. Christians in Israel are decrying another Arab attack on a church in Bethlehem. We have reported extensively on the dwindling and persecuted Christian population in the birthplace of Jesus, which is controlled by the Palestinian Authority. Christians complain of abuse, intimidation, and many of them have fled the city seeking protection in Israel. In the latest incident, several people were injured when a group of Christians were attacked by masked Muslim assailants outside of a church in Bethlehem. Christian leaders are calling on the Palestinian Authority to protect the Christian population of the city and to bring the assailants to justice. The Jerusalem Biblical Zoo celebrated the birth of its second pair of Asiatic lion cubs. The births are the result of a new program to repopulate the endangered felines that were once very prevalent in the land of Israel until the Crusader period, when excessive hunting caused them to virtually disappear. There are currently about 500 Asiatic lions in the world. Most are found in Western India. The breeding program to restore this endangered lion population is a cooperation between the Biblical Zoo and the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria. In sports news, Israel's Lana Kemtai Salpeter won second place in the New York City Marathon, coming in just seven seconds after the first place runner. The 33-year-old Kenyan-Israeli athlete took the bronze medal at the U.S. World Athletics Championship in July, and in August she won the bronze at the 10,000-meter race at the European Championships. Tens of thousands of great white pelicans have landed in Israel on a stopover before migrating to Africa for the winter. More than 50,000 pelicans will take a rest in the Jewish state on their way to the Sinai Desert, where they will follow the Nile River to their winter ponds in Africa. The Israel Nature and Parks Authority welcomed the special visitors by filling water reserves in the Heifer Valley with tons of fresh fish. This was done to keep the birds away from the fields, as well as to help them along their journey. Chairman of the Congressional Israel Allies Caucus in the United States are urging countries to stand against the anti-Israel movement in the United Nations. Representatives Doug Lamborn, Chris Smith, and Steve Shevitt urged world leaders to deny funding to two UN committees, which operate with the sole agenda of delegitimizing and unfairly defaming the state of Israel. In their letters to the world leaders, the congressmen write that the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People and the Division for Palestinian Rights both function as key elements of the anti-Israel apparatus at the UN. They employ staff to generate a regular flow of notoriously biased and inaccurate reporting against Israel, yet they have been repeatedly reauthorized and funded since 1970. Josh Reinstein, the president of the Israel Allies Foundation, praised the initiative. 
saying thanks to Jewish and Christian believers coming together to educate those who bear political responsibility, the support for these two anti-Israel entities has been dropping steadily. Now the Congressional Israel Allies Caucus is leading a push to finally get rid of them altogether. He said this is faith-based diplomacy at its best. Archaeologists at the city of David have discovered an ancient carving that may bear the name of a biblical king. The limestone fragment, which dates to the 8th century before the Common Era, is part of a much larger monument. The partial inscription contains six letters written in Paleo-Hebrew script, which archaeologists believe could be the name of Hezekiah and refer to the Pool of Siloam. Second Chronicles chapter 32 describes King Hezekiah's construction of a tunnel to divert water to the Pool of Siloam in preparation for an impending invasion by the Assyrian army. This impressive feat of engineering has been confirmed by archaeological excavations at the city of David, where a 1,700-foot water tunnel has been excavated. We are living in mysterious yet miraculous times. We've witnessed the most remarkable fulfillment of biblical prophecy, the Jewish people's return to Israel, and the prosperity and contributions of this tiny country in such a short time. Yet we've also seen an unexpected rise in anti-Semitism, which takes the form of anti-Zionism, and alliances between groups that are fighting against the most fundamental biblical values. In the book, Titus, Trump, and the Triumph of Israel, Josh Reinstein answers important questions to clarify what has driven political action from the time that the Roman Emperor Titus destroyed Jerusalem until today, when President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Get your copy today and learn how faith-based diplomacy has changed the world. To order your advanced copy, go to triumphofisrael.com. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Jeremy Gimpel. He is the co-founder of the Land of Israel Fellowship. Jeremy, thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Tell our viewers a little about what is the Land of Israel Fellowship. The Land of Israel Fellowship is a global online community of Jews, of Christians, there's a few Buddhists, a couple of Muslims, people that are seeking after God, people that are looking for a deeper connection to Israel, trying to understand scripture from a biblical Hebrew perspective from the Land of Israel. And it's almost a thousand families from 50 countries. There's a live broadcast every Sunday, and members then get access to about a hundred classes and sessions about the biblical feasts, about prayer, about every Torah portion in the Torah. Now we're entering into the book of Joshua. And it's kind of like an online community of believers from around the world that sort of transcend political boxes, religious boxes, theological boxes, and we all just kind of come together um, to learn Torah together. And to me, it seems like that is the vision of what the Jewish people were supposed to do when we return back to the land of Israel. So the Torah will go forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. And so we said, let's try and see what happens. And all of a sudden, out of the woodworks, all these people came and started connecting. So that's the Land of Israel Fellowship. What's interesting is that you're actually an ordained rabbi. Uh, you were born in America, made Aliyah. But a lot of the people in your fellowship, as you mentioned, are from other religions, mostly Bible-believing Christians. Why do you think it's important to them to learn from a rabbi? Well, um, the Bible was written in the land of Israel. All of the stories of the biblical forefathers, mothers, the prophets of Israel, the foundation of Western civilization all happened in the land of Israel. And if people really love the Bible, then they're going to want to learn it in Hebrew. They're going to want to learn it from a Hebrew perspective, and they're going to want to learn from the Jewish people. There's a beautiful prophecy in the book of Zechariah that says, toward the end of days, 
small pockets of people, ten men from all the nations of the world, will get, grab hold of the corner of a garment of a Jewish man and say, take us with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That they'll at some point be like some sort of U-turn and a return to the roots of Christianity, which were in Bethlehem, which were in Judea, which were in the land of Israel. And they say, you know what, if we really want to understand what it means to be a Christian, well, we really need to understand what it means to be a Jew. And what does it mean uh, to live prophetically in the land of Israel, of prophecies that were mentioned thousands of years ago that are manifesting today, like it's not just a theology, it's a living, breathing, living word. And so that word is coming out of Israel um, alive right now, and people can tune in and they can connect. You know, Judaism has always been really closed off. Uh, people interpret in, in the Jewish per persuasion that to be a light unto the nations is to kind of be an example and, and to show an example. But you're actually taking the Word of God and you're taking the Bible and you're bringing it to people and you're teaching them. Why do you think that's an important thing to do as a Jew? Well, for 2,000 years, the Jewish people just wanted to survive. But the original biblical mandate, I mean, Abraham, he was teaching the world. He wasn't teaching Jews. There were no other Jews. He was bringing the light of God to the nations of the world. And the mandate given to us in Isaiah is to be a light unto the nations. In Isaiah chapter 2, it says the nations are going to stream to Jerusalem to learn of God's ways and to walk in his path, and that the Torah shall go forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. Well, after the ingathering of the exiles to the land of Israel, who is the Torah going out to? It's going out to the world. So what's interesting is that in our fellowship, we have rabbis, we have pastors, Jews and Christians, but it's one word that comes out of Jerusalem that's able to hit a chord with Jews and non-Jews at the same time. And that, I think, is really um, a revolution that we're creating sort of a, a universal language that can connect all different types of believers to the Torah. And that really is the ultimate vision, that the Jewish people come back to the land of Israel, not only build a society that will be an example for the world, but that the actual ancient teachings that we held on to we didn't hold on to it for ourselves. We held on to those teachings about Shabbat, about the holidays, in order that one day we would be able to share them with the rest of the world. And so we're just the luckiest generation in the world that we finally have the chance to share the Torah with the nations. So give me an example of what are the type of things that you're actually teaching. What are people going to learn when they turn in, tune into the fellowship? So it's almost always correlated and rooted into the Torah portion of the week. So the Jewish people, since the times of Ezra the prophet, read a very specific section of the Torah. So imagine there's like one message that comes down to the chosen people every week. You can be in Tel Aviv or in Hong Kong, bump into a Jew in the airport, and you can immediately start talking about the Torah portion of the week because every Jew around the world is learning that same section of the Bible. But in the recent years, there are Christians and believers all over the world that started adopting that same a habit, and they're all now attaching themselves to the Torah portion. And imagine there's like this living word that's going down now to all believers that are open to it and that want to connect to it. And what you'll find is that those Torah portions speak directly to you in your personal life. They speak directly to Israel on a national level. And so often they speak to the global community on an international level. Like there is a specific message that is not a coincidence that is being read by all these believers around the world at the same time. And it's kind of like tapping into the pulse of Israel. And it's beautiful to see this like window of a Catholic nun. We see her on the Zoom. We, she's like, you know, wearing a whole thing and there's Jews and non-Jews and rabbis and pastors. And it's like all of us somehow are able to come together just to, out of respect for the Bible and a love for the Torah. So. It's like a living word. You don't just uh, preach, you actually practice what you pe preach. You are one of the co-founders of Arugot Farms and you've actually created an amazing, an amazing place in the hilltops of Judea. Why was it important to also have a location where people could come and see it for themselves? So the Torah is an experience and the Bible it, well, is a word based in Latin that means book. Torah is a verb. It means to guide, to teach. It is a living action that's happening right now. And so it's one thing to read a book, but it's another thing to experience the Torah. And the greatest way to experience the living Word of God is in the land of Israel. And our mountain is in the heart of Judea. It's the mountains where King David fled, where he wrote many of the book of Psalms. And it's just, you can sense God's presence in the land of Israel like you can't sense anywhere else. And so you can read Korean history, that's not going to make you Korean. But when you study the Torah in the land of Israel, 
it does transform you to become more godly. It brings you closer. It brings a certain spiritual light into your life. So that transformative learning where your head connects to your heart and your learning becomes a prayer, that, can, that experience can happen in the land of Israel. So aside from just a global community virtually, we wanted to have a physical reality in Israel that those people would be able to come and sort of sense the spirit of King David in the mountains of Judea. And it's growing every day. Jeremy, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? I would say that here you are, you've somehow stumbled upon this recording. Take the next step. Go to thelandofisrael.com and join the Land of Israel Fellowship. Come and join, learn with us, pray with us. Come and see what the living Word of God is from the Land of Israel, reaching out to the nations of the world and help us bring the Torah to the nations. Thank you, Jeremy, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Ayesod. I'm Sam Grunwerk, the world chairman of Karen Ayesod, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Over the last year, we have been working around the clock to rescue the Jews of Ukraine. We have evacuated and saved thousands of Jewish people, bringing them back to the Promised Land. Christian support for Israel is more important now than ever before. So come join Karen Ayesod in fulfilling biblical prophecy. Friends of Karen Ayesod and our campaigns all around the world, I'm here in Warsaw, Poland and just completed a very high-level, two-day, intense delegation. I'm standing here at the amazing Israeli field hospital in Ukraine. It's such a proud moment to stand here and see the doctors and nurses from Israel volunteering their time to be here in Ukraine, giving such humanitarian service, such a health service to the local people, those coming from the war and those just who need it on a daily basis. The fact that we as a people are taking on such a task uh, is incredible and it's what Karen Hyasot is all about, saving Jewish lives. We are a special people doing special things and it's thanks to all of you and the generosity of all of you that we're able to do that. And I um, just want to say, I'm Yisrael Khan. Thank you. Thank you. Toda raba. I would like to welcome you to Focus Hotel. This is the Jewish Agency Hotel here in Barca. Here we assist all of the Elim who are coming. We don't want just to send people. We want them to be ready for the Aliyah. So we provide Aliyah counseling. We've seen the explosions. I said to my husband, to Mitchell, we flee. We gather all things and we flee this day. We almost had no things, no personal things. Everything we want is to stay within family, in fact. That's all we need. It's okay to lose everything. We just need to stay together. <laughs> just need to stay together and we will do that. Everything you see here, it's uh, the thing that people donated. And people, I see how they feel. They, really? I'm not sure if they, if they can take, how much they can really? take. Really? Really? And when I, when I, I will take a pajama, say, take two, take three. It's, it's so nice. I'm having two, uh, two t-shirts now. Why are you having only two t-shirts this year? Because when we ran away, it was only one t-shirt I had. And now you are giving me the second one. I'm so happy. Uh, it, it's really hard not to cry. בשבת בבוקר, בשעה 11, פונינו לפולין, 
אחר כך תהיה איזה שתי מזוודות, שני תיקים קטנים. לא תיארתי בחיים, בחיים לא תיארתי שאני עקור. אין לי יותר בית. אין לי יותר בית. שני... אני לא יודע אם אנשים מבינים מה המשמעות. אני בעצמי לא הבנתי, לקח לי שבוע. לקח לי שבוע שזה הגיע אליי, שאני בעצם בן אדם בלי בית, שאני בעצם עקור, נמלט, לא יודע איך קוראים לזה. אני לא בוכה על זה או משהו כרגע עכשיו, אבל זה הרגשה אחת הפחות טובות שיכולות להיות. This is without doubt the proudest uh, day of, of my time in the role and it's a privilege that we have Israel, we have an incredibly strong diaspora and we have a structure amongst us to act and act swiftly. When we use the slogan saving Jewish lives, it's not used lightly. We saw evidence of this today and I think we can all be very proud of the partnership. To be able to be in a position to help and assist you and to see this day where you are going to Israel and making Aliyah and becoming Israelis. We will do all of our efforts to bring you to the families of your family, the families that are from the front, the children that are young. Am Yisrael Chai, Am Yisrael Chai, Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael Chai, Am Yisrael Chai, Am Yisrael Chai. And all of this is only thanks to your generous support and your dedication for Israel and for the Jewish people. You have shown that we are truly one people, Lev Echad, Am Echad, and Am Yisrael Chai. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, visit khisrael.org. The Israel Allies Foundation is one of the most important pro-Israel organizations in the United States and around the world. Thanks to the Israel Allies Foundation, its parliamentary caucuses and our Christian friends and partners around the world, the bond between our faiths has never been stronger. I just want to begin by saying thank you to the Israel Allies Foundation for bringing us together from near and far to say with one voice, America stands with Israel. The Israel Allies Foundation is ensuring a better future for Israel, America, and the rest of the world. Thank you all for being Israel's allies. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.